Hi, hello everyone. Um, welcome to my talk on TPM NV storage and EA policies with uh, TSS FAPI. Um, let's start real quick with who am I? Um, I work for Fraunhofer. I'm working on cyber physical system security and automotive security and specifically on trustworthy platforms. And I've been a consumer of TPMs for more than 13 years now. Um, I've been a TCG member almost as long and uh, I'm there the work group chair of the TSS work group. And also in the open source realm, I'm the maintainer or one of the maintainers of the TPM to TSS project, which is an implementation of the TPM software stack uh, compliant with the TCG specs of the TPM to TSS engine, the open SSL engine and TPM to TODB, even though thankfully Jonas is doing most of the work there. Um, what we're we going to talk about today, um, I'll very briefly go over what TPMs are um, and then um, we'll go a little bit deeper about um, what TPM NV storage is and can do, what TPM EA policies are and what you can do with those, how you can facilitate the TSS, especially the FAPI interface for working with EA policies and NV and some, some minor use cases at the end to show you some of its use, um, usefulness and, and practical applications. So let's get started. What is a TPM? So a TPM is a security chip on the main board. And you can see an old example of that over here. Uh, it's soldered on there. And um, I have to thank Microsoft for giving us all TPMs for cheap in our desktops and laptops because uh, they required them via the Windows logo program. But also there's been increased adoption um, nowadays and embedded. There exists um, hats for the Raspberry Pi. Um, I've seen some people working on Sapphire. Um, there's also been some people working on uh, SPI interfaces for TSS for ESP32s, um, Oryx implementations, similar stuff. Um, so these chips are pretty high security. They come with, uh, or Usually they come with common criteria certificates and such, and they are capable of doing some cryptographic operations. They can do some storage that we're gonna talk about today. And most uh, famously, they are capable of recording boot hash values, AKA integrity measurements. Um, what's very important is to know that they are passive devices. So the TPM cannot actively interfere and um, take away ownership of your platform, any of that sort. And uh, nowadays they are very nicely supported on Linux. Um, first of all, given their driver support, but also all the way up through the TSS stack and then the various projects that build upon the TSS stack. So what's it known for? It's specifically known for what we see here on the left-hand side, which is it can do crypto. It has an RSA engine, ECC engine, um, SHA-1, SHA-256 engines. And it can do some AES, even though the AES functions are not exposed externally, but they are used internally for um, storing its keys. So keys are, in the case of the TPM, usually stored outside of the chip, but encrypted via an AES key that is only known to the TPM. Second most uh, well-known functionality is, as I mentioned, the integrity functionalities of the TPM. So the TPM will record the boot measurements or the, the measurements or the hash values of the various components that are um, used to include of the platform and store those in these PCRs and then you can do a quote command. But that's not what we are gonna talk about today. Today our focus is on the right-hand side. Um, the, first of all, the NV capabilities of the TPM so it can persistently store keys, but it also exposes general purpose NV indices. And we'll be looking at the uh, enhanced authorization policies, or as I will usually refer to them, EA policies, um, as you heard in the beginning of the talk already. All right, let's jump right in there. Storage. So TPM comes with a bunch of storage. Um, or not, not so big of a bunch of storage, but with some storage. 
and it's often used um, synonymously with the NV indices, but we have to differentiate. So the TPM has an internal flash and that flash is used to store um, internal TPM data structures such, such as its um, seeds, also I use boot counters um, and other kinds of things. But also the TPM exposes an interface to the user to use some of those, uh, some of that storage. Um, and that's called or referred to as NV indices or NV index handles. And yeah, those are exposed via an API of the TPM and you can identify those by their um, index range. So every TPM hand, every TPM object has a handle. And in case of an NV index, those start with zero uh, X on the very high byte, as opposed to, for example, transient objects that start with an 80 hex or persistent objects that start with an 81 hex. Um, this value range is fixed, the zero X zero one, but within this range, there are some value ranges and conventions defined by TCG. So within the range of uh, 01 C0 and a bunch of zeros to 01 C07 FFF, you will, for example, find EK or endorsement key certificates. The range that we are most interested in for our application is the range from 0x0180 to 0x01BF and FFFF. This is the range that's defined for the owner of the platform. So whenever you want to do something, you, whenever there's software uh, you want to write um, that uses NV storage, you'll probably want to put your handles or your NV indices to find those in this range. And I guess a very prominent example of something that's um, using or going to be using the TPM NV storage also in this range is script setup. There is a merge request. So we've been working for some time um, on how to integrate TPM into crypt setup. So we have a bit locker like feature on Linux as well. And um, the new crypt setup TPM tokens as they are defined in the mentioned pull request um, actually make use of this NV storage. So in order to look at what your NV storage is, there's two ways you can use um, TPM2 get capabilities or get cap and just see the NV index ranges. And here you can already see that there are um, specifically two user indexes that I defined, which are in the 8000 and 8001. Then there's two certificates in the 01CO range. And then there's another three. Those come from um, platform. Those are used for um, BIOS. PC BIOS things. <laughs> so just that you don't wonder when you have a fresh TPM, you will usually find the five bottom NV indexes on your platform already. Another way to look at those is via the TSS2 get info call. And I'll go a little bit into what the differences between those two calls is uh, later, but there you can see, unfortunately we don't have the hex representation because JSON, um, but we do have the integer values there as well. So what can NV storage do? Well, first of all, um, there's different types or you, you basically what you do is you define NV indexes that you wanna use. So you allocate memory to say so under an NV index. When you do this allocation, you can make a choice of what type um, this NV index shall be. There is the ordinary type, which is general purpose memory. You can write arbitrary data in there and you can read arbitrary, uh, read the data out again. But then there's also special kinds of NV indexes. And a um, very interesting one, for example, is the counter type. Um, the counter type is a monotonic counter. And one, when you initialize this NV index, it starts at the highest counter value that was ever recorded on this TPM. So if you clear um, the counter, or you, uh, you, you delete the index and you re-instantiate the index again, it will start off at the same counter value that you had on the index before. That's in order to um, prevent rollback attacks on those NV counter indices, because usually they might be used for something like usage counting or version counting of firmware or stuff like that. 
And of course, you can only ever increment this counter. You cannot arbitrarily write to this counter. Then we have bit mask types. They um, allow you to set bits in this NV index, but not clear them. So this is basically, um, yeah, similar to fuses. You can use them uh, in the same way as you use fuses in, for example, SOCs. Then we have the extend type. Extend types are similar to PCRs. The, you don't just write to them, but instead when um, you want to do a write or a write equivalent operation, what the TPM will do is it will take the old content of this um, index. It will append the data that you want to put in there. It will hash this together and then the hash of this is stored in this um, NV index. So basically what you get is you get a hash chain of every data that you ever wrote into this index which can be kind of nice to, for example, prevent logs from being um, from being altered um, after a, by an attacker or whatever afterwards. And then finally, there is a um, an index called of type pin, which is a rather newer one. The purpose of that was that so far the TPM only had a global um, anti brute force counter or dictionary attack prevention mechanism. And so if you entered too many false password attempts, or uh, then the TPM would go into a lockout mode and you would have to provide it a special password to reset the lockout counter, or you would have to wait a certain amount of time until the counter um, is decremented again. Here we have the ability to use an NV index that carries its own counter and its own threshold. So it's an NV, uh, it's a 64-bit index, I think, and the first 32 bits are used for the counter and the second 32 bits are used for the threshold. And once the counter, and uh, whenever a uh, authorization fails, the counter is incremented. Once it reach, uh, reaches the threshold, um, the counter um, further attempts to authenticate against this NV index are blocked. So this is kind of neat possibilities. Um, regarding the uh, TPM storage, how much storage should we have available? This is, uh, it's a tight resource um, because of course it's a cost factor. Every byte of flash in a security chip uh, costs a lot of money. Um, the TCG estimates some typical usage and thereby defines minimums of what needs to be provided. And here on the right hand side, you can see the um, evaluation of what is assumed to be needed. And that results in almost 4K of minimum storage that shall be provided. Um, might probably be a little bit more on most chips. Um, and most importantly, it's not as tight as sometimes stated where people say every single index counts but it's still pretty tight. And you'd have to keep in mind that this is shared with persistent keys. So if you have a platform, for those that know the concept with a persistent SRK, um, that goes away from the same storage as uh, NV indexes. Um, in order to create an NV index, so this is a very basic example where we're using some command line tools and you see the, the output at the bottom. Um, we call NV, uh, create NV, and actually this call for some reason got scrolled out of the terminal, I'm sorry for that. It asked for a new password to be assigned. Uh, I, sent, I assigned an empty password and then it asked for um, owner authorization, aka storage hierarchy authorization, which is the entity that um, is allowed to clear or deny uh, access to defining and um, removing of NV indices. And then we can, as I said, it's a general purpose store, so we can write to the store and we can read to the store. And you see in the list that um, there is the NV owner, my index at the bottom that was created that we're using now. Um, another example for a counter would be here. Um, as you can see, if I create a counter, I give it the type counter at the very top. Um, I can then call increment on this counter and will increment and we see we jump from 0E to 0F as you see I didn't use the counter on my TPM very much 
but it initialized at zero E. If I was to now delete the counter and recreate the counter, it would start at uh, zero F afterwards. And as you can also see, there is no way for us to just write arbitrary data, even though by the length it should fit in there, um, given it's, oh no, uh, it's actually a bite too much, um, but still it would always deny us to put a counter in there. And just for the record, a counter is always 64 bit uh, unsigned. Um, yeah, so this is what TPM NV storage is in a, a very brief nutshell. And um, now we're gonna see how we can combine that with policies. Again, some background, what is a um, EA policy? So the TPM has a pretty versatile policy framework. Uh, it can be used for a bunch of things. And, um, but since it's an embedded security chip, they had to come up with a way to efficiently store those policies in all of these objects. So what they did was um, they said, okay, a policy statement, the policy expression is gonna be a combination um, as a combination of policy elements will be encoded as a um, hash chain. So basically each policy element and on the top right here, we see we have the policy elements A, B, C. Each of those elements can be represented as a hash value. And when you wanna end combine those elements, what you do is you build a hash chain that starts with a bunch of zeros and then your hash Basically, you extend, um, hash extend each of the policy elements into the digests, and you end up with a single digest in the end that uh, cryptographically at least uh, correlates to the policy that was defined. And then whenever you define something in the TPM, um, the TPM will only store this digest value. Um, be that a, tip, um, a key object or be that an NV index or be that the authorization for a hierarchy or whatever. In order to um, make this now more versatile, you want to have an OR element in there as well. So what we have is we have the special policy element called policy OR that instead of just taking one sub value takes up to eight sub values uh, or yeah, incoming, let's say incoming digest values. And so by that, you can start combining a bunch of subtrees, as they're often referred to, into a single um, policy digest tree. If you want to have more than just eight, um, the convention, uh, you can, of course, chain a bunch of ores together. And the convention is that you would do so only on the top level, and you would make them um, flat so that you will have the topmost or and then you would only have ors on the next layer and then you would start with the actual policies and that should be enough for um, up to 64 different policy branches underneath if you want to go beyond that again you make uh, the first three um, layers of the tree only ors and then you go on um, and as i mentioned the tpm only tracks the topmost hash so what you need to do is you need to store the actual policies that you want to evaluate outside of the TPM. And then you call the TPM and for basically for each policy element, or sorry, you start off by opening a policy session and the TPM then has an internal uh, hash value of zero that it keeps track of. And then you call a bunch of policy commands on this policy session and each time this, this policy evaluates true, the TPM will go ahead and uh, update the hash value according to the uh, to this schematics. And so for each policy element, you call the policy commands. And in the end, um, you use this policy session where the final uh, hash value is uh, stored inside the TPM and you call the operation on the key that you or the NV object that you want to use and the TPM does the comparison to see if the policy was fulfilled by the um, proofs of the policy that you gave before via the commands. Um, the amount of policy elements that you have is pretty large as you see here. Um, I guess the most important ones or the most interesting ones that you wanna look at are of course the policy or, 
um, the policy signed where you can have a challenge response scheme, policy secret where you can defer to another um, object. So if you want to have authorization for object A, you can defer this to an um, authorization to object B. And if that's fulfilled, um, the, the first one is fulfilled. Policy aura I already mentioned, policy PCR is the interesting one when it comes to um, boot value or um, yeah, boot integrity. Counter timer can be interesting and uh, command code is definitely interesting. So each of the OR branches, for example, you can restrict to a certain command code. So you can have a different policy for writing an index versus reading an index, or you can have a different policy for using a key versus exporting a key. Um, when it comes to exporting, there's also duplication select. I won't get into too much detail here. Policy password is, of course, interesting, where basically you say, okay, I want to have the user enter the password that is associated with this object as well. And then um, policy NV, which we're going to be looking at a little more later. Um, most of these policy elements are then also parameterized. So that makes the total set of combinations even, even larger. For example, the policy NV, um, it compares the content of an NV to an operand um, that's also provided as part of the policy. And then you have a lot of operations. So you have equal or not equal, pretty obvious. But then you also have um, signed and unsigned numeric comparisons, which is kind of nice. And you also have um, corresponding to the um, bit mask type of, um, of or the fuses like behavior of NV indices that I talked about earlier, you here have the equivalent in the policy where you can say only if a certain bit is still clear um, in a certain NV index, this policy is allowed to evaluate for true or vice versa, only if a certain bit has been set, certain feature activated, whatnot, this policy is allowed to evaluate for true. Um, also interesting in there, you can um, make these comparisons also against just subparts of the NV index, um, since there is an offset parameter as well. And then there's also um, the size of the operand. So you can say, I only want to compare to a certain, uh, to certain subbytes of the NV index. And in practice, it would look something like this. Um, if you were to directly call the TPM via these policies. And um, so this code was taken from the script setup TPM things. And here you can already see that, as I said, you start off with a policy session and then you call a bunch of policy commands, in this case, policy PCR, policy password, policy command code in this order on the policy session. And you can, and then you, the TPM internally updates the digest counter in this, um, in the session that was started here. And in the end, you then go ahead and either return the session or you get the, the digest. However, this is kind of um, unnice or kind of complicated to program because for something like a policy PCR, you need to read out the, um, the PCR values beforehand um, in order to make sense out of them. So there's another routine that you have to do and you have to hash them together and then put them in there. So it becomes kind of, kind of ugly potentially. And so we thought about how you could make this nicer to work with. And yeah, the, the API that was used here is part of the uh, TSS, it's the ESOS API. And this ESOS API gives you the low level access to all functionalities of the TPM. Um, as I mentioned, so it's the go-to if you are in a, um, either in an environment where you don't have too many capabilities or if you want to do some very borderline um, use cases that you want to implement. And um, you have to manually keep track of the policy, as I mentioned, and then you have to execute this policy. So it's only very only too interesting if you always have the same policy. And for, for usage, you can use the TPM2 tools and those map more or less directly to, the, um, to this ESIS API. Um, 
with some some convenience functionality put on top of it though and but then there is um, also a rather new library that was released uh, beginning of this year that we call the FAPI or Feature API. I know we're bad with names, but uh, we have to stick with them once they're out there. So this is a more convenient interface to talk to the TPM because it automates a lot of stuff. Um, first of all, most importantly for this talk, was it, what it does is it um, comes with a language that gives us the capability to express policies as JSON in a declarative way. Um, then it also automates away the whole um, satisfaction of policies using the policy sessions. And this is done completely under the covers. It also stores and keeps track of the policies in the metadata of the objects. So it's completely transparent to the user um, where the stuff is stored, how it's um, evaluated, how digests are calculated, stuff like that. And um, we have the corresponding tools. So as you can see here, and that's what I mentioned before, the TPM2 tools map more or less directly to the ESOS API. The TSS2 tools actually map one-to-one -to, -one to the feature API. So you will see, as I, or as you saw before, um, the parameters that you provide there the, for example, byte buffers or um, also, um, also the, the strings that you provide to the TSS2 tools, they are passed one-to-one -one into the feature API and the feature API doesn't come with any TPM specific data types anymore. It more or less uh, uses standard data types such as uh, M strings or um, JSON or just byte buffers. And everything I'm gonna talk about now, how to use the feature API to work with policies on NV. It pretty much works the same way um, for key objects. So just instead of uh, create NV, you call create key. All right, what does such a policy look like um, in JSON? As I said, um, the, our goal was to make it a declarative language, which makes it much more convenient for the user. And it should be human readable and human editable. And if you remember three slides before, we had those uh, a complete screen um, with all the policy commands and policy session. This is what the same policy looks like in um, the JSON encoding, with the JSON policy language encoding. We have the PCR, and as you can see, it's much easier to read them because we just say we have the PCR, we want to evaluate against the current PCR values of uh, zero through two. We require the entering of password and we restrict the usage of this policy to an entry read. And this is all you have to write in order to achieve the same result. Um, and then this policy is stored in the uh, feature API's object meta metadata store. And whenever you access the NV index that uh, contains this policy, it gets ev uh, automatically evaluated in the background. Um, yeah, that was already that part. And um, now let's go or jump or dive right into some example. So what I brought here with, uh, with me was um, one of the most common use cases I get asked, I wanna have warm memory. Warm memory is write once, read many. And this is pretty trivial to set up in such a JSON policy. We can see here on the right, what we do is we provided some arbitrary kind of description and we said it's of type or, and the branches are read and write. And for the read case, we basically say that you can always read so we, we restrict it to the command code and we read, and this branch always evaluates the true if that's the case. For the write case, we say you can do this as long as the NV written bit of the NV index is set to no. And so what this does is um, the TPM will check that this is the case. And once it's written, um, once the, or as soon as uh, the NV index content was written once, this bit is set to true and never reset again. Um, those are the commands. If you wanna um, test this out on your own machine, just uh, be aware you have to call a TSS2 provision in the very beginning. And I would highly recommend that you go to uh, TSS301 uh, um, or master uh, for that matter. Um, because we, we changed some of the handling of the policies going from 2.4 to 3.1. 
Um, when you call that, this is basically what happens. Again, you are asked for a password for this index. I'm setting that to zero because we're not using the password anywhere here in the policy. So if you used um, a um, password element anywhere in here, uh, that makes may, would make sense. In this case, we don't. Um, I'm asked for the owner authorization again. And then I want to write the hello LSS string to this uh, V index again. And what FAPI, aka V, um, what FAPI will do is FAPI will call a callback, which is called a branch selection callback, something like that. Um, and the, what the tools do is they register the C callback and um, so the FAPI will then provide the different branch names. You do your choice, choose two in this case, and it all succeeds. And once we then read, again, we are asked which policy or which branch we want to evaluate to. We pick the read branch and uh, we get back the result. And as we can see, as I said, it's a warm white write once memory. If we call the write again, um, we will be failing here and we can see that the NV write finish failed because the policy check failed. Because in this case, the, um, the NV written bit was actually true and not false. And so the digest value of the policy session and digest value stored for the NV index don't match anymore. Um, the next example I brought with me was um, some, some equal comparison. This is, I think, when it comes to NV indices, the probably the most commonly used one besides maybe the, the, the bit set testing. So in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the NV index and we're gonna check um, what the correct value is. And in this case, um, if you wanna translate this over to um, the string representation, so this is the hex representation, basically of the, of the hello world, uh, the, the word hello. And um, so only if my index still contains the word hello, we're gonna evaluate to true. And as we can see here, um, again, I created this NV index and uh, I can write to the newly created index and it would just work seamlessly. But once I write something else like by into the original my index, uh, writing to my new index will be failing because again, the policy, um, the policy NV execution failed and thereby I cannot progress my um, policy session any further or FAPI cannot do so. So this makes the usage of policies just way more convenient. And I can tell you from personal experience that it's pretty much not too much fun uh, to write up the ESOS calls and it's way easier to write these JSON files. Of course, um, JSON is not the, um, or writing JSON in a regular editor is not the most, still not the most convenient thing. So something that we just started, and by me, I mean Peter Huber came up with the idea and Jürgen Rapp and myself um, are now participating in that as well as we are coming up or writing a JSON schema for this policy language. Um, it's still work in progress at the time that I'm recording here. Hopefully by the time um, that this is aired, we will have it ready on, on the TPM2 GitHub IO soft, um, website. Um, and here you can already get a sneak peek at the whole thing. And the idea is that you can click together your policy. And just for fun of it, um, I brought you an example here. You can see this is the example from earlier and I actually did, used this editor in order to write that. And we can see that what we can update it here to equal or not equal. And we can very easily add another item for example, if we want to have password authorization and we can add another item, if we want to have uh, the NV written bit set to um, set to true, and then it's gonna, only going to evaluate that way. So yeah, this is still work in progress. Um, unfortunately, it is still work in progress because we, when we originally defined the language, we allowed a bit too many values. We were pretty pretty broad and for example, integers can be 
provided in either as a JSON integer or it can be provided in as a hex value in a string. And so this uh, gets kind of tough to implement in a JSON schema, but uh, hopefully we can sort stuff out and uh, it will seamlessly work uh, once this is aired. All right, so what did we see? What did we talk about? As I said, um, the TPM has pretty nice capabilities for um, user storage. It also has very nice policy capabilities. And especially on this later part, I think there's a lot of things that still can be, um, yeah, can be discovered in the future. Um, I remember that I, in the past, did some some interesting firmware update schemes where you can have the firmware version counter be part of the NV and you only provide access to your storage partitions or data partitions if the firmware is actually the latest firmware. Um, so you prevent rollbacks, something that uh, we know is a hard thing to do if you don't have something like a TPM capable device with a counter. Um, yeah, um, and I think, or I hope that um, FAPI will be the enabling factor for really getting people, getting maybe you in the audience to um, explore and elaborate on the capabilities using EA policies. And hopefully the uh, GUI editor will be even more interesting um, or make this even more interesting and more easy to use. Um, for further information, um, two days ago uh, here at OSSE, no, one day ago, there um, was the talk on uh, TPMs not rocket science by Johannes and Peter. That's very interesting. And then I would highly recommend you come here to our um, community page, tpm2-software.github.io, where you will find uh, a lot of talks that were given, I think, at LSSEU um, three years ago. Peter already gave a talk with some initial introduction. You find a lot of um, tutorials, you find a Gitter chat that's becoming more and more active um, where people help each other out, stuff like that. And hopefully also the GUI editor is gonna be there uh, in the near future. All right, so thank you very much for your interest and staying to the end. And uh, I hope the examples are interesting and I uh, highly recommend you test them out and yeah, see you in chat.